Good afternoon, and welcome to the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation's Meet the Scientist monthly webinar series. I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein, President and CEO of the Foundation, and your host for today's webinar. The Brain and Behavior Research Foundation funds the most innovative ideas in neuroscience and psychiatry to better understand the causes and develop new ways to treat brain and behavior disorders. These disorders include addiction, ADHD, anxiety, autism, bipolar disorder, borderline personality disorder, depression, eating disorders, OCD, post-traumatic stress, and schizophrenia. Since 1987, the foundation has awarded more than $408 million to fund more than 5,900 grants to scientists around the world. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Christopher Pettinger. Dr. Pettinger is Associate Professor of Psychiatry and Assistant Chair for Translational Research, as well as Director of the OCD Research Clinic and co-director of the Neuroscience Research Training Program at Yale University School of Medicine. He was a 2015 Independent Investigator grantee and a 2007 and 2009 Young Investigator grantee. Today's webinar will begin with Dr. Pettinger's presentation. This will be followed by a question and answer period, depending upon how much time we have left over. Please feel free to submit your questions at any time. Following the presentation, I will ask as many as possible in the time allotted. And now, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Pittenger. Chris, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jeff. Really a pleasure to be here today and to speak with all of you about brain and behavior-based strategies in the treatment of OCD. Um, as I looked through the registrants, a uh, large number of registrants for this webinar today, I, I see that we have a very diverse group. We have, we have patients and family members. We have, um, we have uh, doctors and psych psychologists and other practitioners, and we also have researchers. And so I expanded what I was going to talk about. I'm going to try to cover a fair bit of ground, starting with a basic description of what OCD is, how prevalent it is in the population and then going through a little bit of both the biology and the psychology of OCD before getting, as time permits, to a little bit of some novel research at the end. So um, I, I realize that for the researchers on the line, you, you, may, uh, you may be waiting for this stuff at the end, but um, I, I felt if I jump straight to that, I may not be doing justice for the, to, the, to the large number, the, the breadth of the audience that we have on the call today. Um, if I can get my... There we go. So this is an outline of the talk, um, and I'll be returning to this slide as we go through to keep us oriented as we go through these different topics that I hope to cover. Um, I do have some, uh, some conflicts. This is a list of my funding. Uh, the things that are relevant to today's talk, we are running a current trial by Biohaven Pharmaceuticals, which is relevant to the use of glutamate modulators in the treatment of OCD, so that has some relevance to today's talk, and I've done some consulting for them. Um, and I do have a patent on neurofeedback, which we're going to be talking about at the very end, although that patent's not currently doing anything. But, but there are potential conflicts, just so everyone's aware. All right. So obsessive compulsive disorder affects about one person in 40 worldwide. The estimates vary in different studies in the different countries, but they seem to converge on something close to that number. It's a huge number of people. That's something like 8 million people in this country and something like 30 plus million um, worldwide. Uh, the disorder is defined, uh, the definition hasn't changed very much since 1980 in the DSM-3. It was revised in 2013 in DSM-5, but it hasn't changed very much. It's obsessive compulsive disorder is defined by the presence of obsessions and compulsions, that's the name. And obsessions are as defined on the slide here. They are recurrent and persistent thoughts, images or urges that are experienced as intrusive or unwanted and that typically produce anxiety or distress. So there's a few important points in that definition. So they're recurrent or persistent. We all get things that pop into our heads that are, you know, may strike us as odd or may even cause us some discomfort, but if they're not recurrent and persistent, we're not going to call them an obsession. They can be thought, so a typical thought would be, if I touch that, I'm going to be contaminated. 
that, that would be a, a thought. But they can also, and this is important, they can also be images or even urgent. So it can be a, a visual image, usually of a disturbing scene. If that comes back over and over again, that can be an obsession. An urge to do something that we really have no desire to do, but we sort of feel that urge. If that comes back over and over again and causes distress, that can be an obsession. And these thoughts, urges, or images are intrusive or unwanted. They feel alien in some way. They feel like they've been sort of imposed on us, not by an external force by any means, by our, but by our own brain. And they necessarily produce distress. Otherwise, we wouldn't call them an obsession, and that probably wouldn't lead to any clinical problems. And importantly, someone uh, who's experiencing obsessions tries to ignore or suppress the thoughts, urges, or impulses to some extent. And one of the ways that people try to suppress or control them is through compulsions. So compulsions are repetitive behavior or mental acts that someone feels driven to perform in response to an obsession or according to rigid rules. So for example, if, if the obsession is, <coughs> excuse me, if the obsession is that my hands are dirty, I'm contaminated, I may have germs, then the compulsion could be to wash. And that may help with the anxiety some, but typically it doesn't help enough. The anxiety comes back and thus the compulsion, the washing gets repeated over and over again. I've illustrated in these images three categories of obsessions and compulsions that are the most common. Between them, these three categories cover about 70% of obsessions and compulsions. One is contamination, which I've already illustrated, the intrusive thought that, the, uh, that I'm, I'm contaminated, I have germs on my hand in some way. It can be germs. It can also be sort of a, me a metaphorical contamination, contamination with evil or contamination with, with some kind of um, moral turpitude. It doesn't have to be physical. It doesn't have to be germs. And, but contamination is usually coupled with compulsive washing. A second category, actually the most common, is intrusive thoughts of, of harm, of bad things happening. And a classic example would be um, that someone's going to break into my house and kill my children. That's an intrusive, and that if, that if that thought becomes repetitive and intrusive, that can be an obsession. And a compulsion that went with that might be checking the lock. And checking the lock is fine. Checking it twice might be appropriate in some context. Checking it 30 times over the course of two hours so that you can't get to sleep um, would be considered an obsessive and a compulsion. That's a second category. A third category is a need for things to be symmetrical or balanced or in order. Um, I have to admit, I have a little bit of that one. This, uh, this picture of the Fig Newtons here bothers me uh, because the order is broken. Things aren't lined up the way they ought to be. Um, and so if that becomes so bothersome that one, that, that it, it really causes a lot of distress and there's a compulsive need to fix it, then that can be an obsession and a compulsion. As I hope this description makes clear, obsessive compulsive disorder can be enormously varied. It can be enormously heterogeneous. So two patients can have very different treatments, very different symptoms, but they're all characterized by this combination of intrusive thoughts, images, or urges that cause distress and repetitive behaviors that try to neutralize or control that distress. That's the unifying theme. A little bit about uh, the, the prevalence, the epidemiology of, of obsessive compulsive disorder. It's been called a hidden epidemic because it's much more common than most people realize. I think it's in the last decade has come out of the shadows a bit more, but it affects one person in 40. 2.5, 2.7% over the course of a lifetime. That's an enormous number. Um, in a, one of the earliest World Health Organization calculations of not, not causes of death, but causes of disability, obsessive compulsive disorder made it into the top 10. And those numbers have fluctuated a little in, in subsequent um, iterations, and they're now looking at sort of anxiety in general. It's a little harder to pin down disability due to obsessive compulsive disorder. But the fact that this condition made it into the top 10 in their first iteration of that study speaks to the enormous suffering and, and the restriction of lives that can happen when people suffer from this condition, especially when it's severe. Um, of the anxiety disorders, and prior to the DSM-5 in 2013, OCD was considered an anxiety disorder. It's now separated into its own category, which is a, I mean, it's a bookkeeping change, but, um, but uh, it was back in this 2010 paper considered with the other anxiety disorders. Obsessive compulsive disorder was of all of those disorders, the one that is most likely to be severe in the way to the, in the extent to which it affects people's quality of lives. 
And diagnosis is often missed or delayed. It's very common for me to see a patient who's been treated for depression or for anxiety for five years, for 10 years, and only recently, or only when they come to see me, recognize that an under, the underlying problem is, is actually obsessive compulsive disorder. People will often recognize that their thoughts and behaviors are excessive or may seem irrational or crazy to someone else, and therefore they hide them. People with OCD are very good often very good at hiding their symptoms to an extent that people with, with psychosis or with a major mood disorder or with a substance abuse disorder have more difficulty doing. Um, we do have good treatments for OCD. I'm going to review some of those, both psychotherapy when done properly and certain medications. Um, but up to 25% or even 30% of cases are refractory even to the best treatments that we have to offer. So we have in, in, in treatment of OCD, we have three challenges. One is delayed or missed diagnosis. Two is that the best treatments aren't brought to bear. But three is that even when diagnosis is made and even when the best treatments are, on, are brought to bear, 25% case of cases uh, continue to, to have really pretty severe symptoms. Um, and, and so that's a, a, there's a real need there. And uh, we and others are, are continuing to do research to try to address this with the support of BBRF and, and other organizations. So that's really a lightning tour um, of the, the overall symptoms and diagnosis of OCD and how it, how it affects people. Um, I now want to move on to an equally quick tour of some of the neurobiology that underlies OCD. We know very little about um, the genes that contribute to OCD. We know it has a genetic component. We know very little about the genetics. We know very little about, very little about the cellular abnormalities that may contribute. But we know quite a bit about the neural circuitry that's abnormal in OCD. And that's because back when functional neuroimaging was first developed back in the 1980s, OCD was amongst the first, I think perhaps the first, psychiatric condition in which specific regions of the brain were found to be abnormally active in people um, with the condition compared to controls. And this is one of the very first studies shown. This is a PET, a positron emission tomography study by Lou Baxter at UCLA from 1987. Um, what you see in the colors there is how much energy the brain is using. These are horizontal slices through the brain. Um, I don't know if you can see my arrow, but that's the, that, this is the back of the brain and this is the front. Um, Oh, the top row of images there is how much energy a healthy person's brain is using, and the bottom is someone with OCD. And what you can see is that there are specific regions, a couple of them are indicated by those orange arrows, where the person with OCD's brain is much more active. The one in the middle, shown uh, in the, the bottom middle panel, is the, uh, both the insula and the underlying caudate and putamen, and the one on the right is the orbitofrontal cortex. These are regions we're going to come back to in later slides. So this is really very remarkable. This is when this, this technology of being able to look at brain activity was brand new, and these patients with OCD were found to have elevated activity, not all over the brain, but in these specific regions. Follow-up studies, there's easily 30 studies that have addressed this um, over the years, if not more. I'm showing you some of the original ones because I think that they, they were really landmarks and deserve acknowledgement. Um, this, this one by Scott Rauch and colleagues at Mass General Hospital in Harvard, uh, published in 1994, is asking a slightly different question. What they did in that, in that first study is they said, how do people with OCD, how does the brain activity in people with OCD compare to people without OCD? And they came up with the orbitofrontal cortex and the basal ganglia. Um, in this study, they took people with OCD and say, said, what happens when their symptoms get worse? So they scanned people with OCD. And then they, made, they induced their symptoms. They made their symptoms worse. This is easiest to do in people who have contamination symptoms just by exposing them to a potential contaminant or, or the idea of one. I think in this one, they gave people a, what they said was a sweaty towel. Um, and so that, that triggered their symptoms, made them more anxious. And then they compare the induced symptoms to the baseline image and say, okay, what parts of the brain get more active when symptoms are activated? And remarkably, they come up with the same collection of regions. Shown in the upper left there with the orange arrow, that's the orbitofrontal cortex. To the right, you see the caudate and the putamen, which are major components of the basal ganglia. You also, in the lower left, see the caudate nucleus, shown by the orange arrow in the lower left. So the same circuit comes up uh, when we induce symptoms as comes up when we compare OCD to controls. And that circuit is summarized here. 
I'm not going to go through all of the details, but on the right, you see a schematic uh, horizontal section through the brain. The green at the front is the, um, the frontal cortex. And then the deep structures, the blue is the caudate and putamen, and then deeper structures of the basal ganglia. And the way those are interconnected with one another is shown on the left. And the key point is that the cortex projects to the deep structures, to the thalamus, which then projects back up to the cortex. Uh, it forms kind of a loop. Now, of course, life is more complicated than this. Uh, and one of the ways that it's more complicated is that cortex in this figure is described as a single thing. But of course, the cortex isn't a single thing. The cortex is the entire outside mantle of the brain. And different regions of the cortex process different sorts of information. And what's become clear um, is that these different circuits, hyperactivity or um, pathology in these different circuits from different parts of the cortex down through the basal ganglia can lead to different types of symptoms. I'm not going to try to go through that in great detail. It's summarized nicely in this review by Dan Stein and colleagues that just came out last year. Um, so, so these, but, but uh, the, the key point is that there's a there's pathological abnormality of this cortical basal ganglia circuitry, but that can be processing different kinds of information depending on which part of the cortex and which part of the basal ganglia circuitry is involved. A final type of study that has continued to focus our attention on this basal ganglia circuitry is treatment studies. And I've again picked one early one that I think is particularly elegant which is this 2002 paper by Hansen and colleagues. And what they did was they did a brain scan, again, a PET imaging study of patients at the beginning of treatment and then at the end of treatment. And you see their brain images on the left. What you see on the right is a, is a diagram of the intensity of their symptoms. We measure the intensity of their symptoms using this scale called the Yale Brown Obsessive Compulsive Scale or Y-box, runs from zero to 40. And then on the, on the Y-axis, the vertical axis here, you see how, how, what the activity of the caudate nucleus was, this yellow region shown on the brain scans on the left. So in the filled symbols here, you see where these patients were at the beginning, before treatment. And you can see their Y boxes were pretty high, shown by the fact that those symbols are to the, to the right, towards 40 on the, on the horizontal axis. And their caudate uh, metabolism, their caudate activity was pretty high, shown by the fact that they're up high on the Y axis. And then after treatment, which in this case was with the SSRI antidepressant paroxetine, the, the open symbols here are the same patients. They all moved down, meaning they all, or at least most of them got better, except for one or two. And they all had reduced caudate um, activity. So as symptoms get better, the hyperactivity in the same circuit improves. This is, again, a large literature, about 20 studies. These have been nicely summarized in a review a couple years ago by van der Straas and Damien Denise and their colleagues. Um, and what they found was that the, the changes with treatment, both with psychotherapy and with medication treatment, are in the same circuit. They're in the cortex, especially the orbitofrontal cortex, the stride, striatum, the caudate and putamen, and the thalamus. So the same circuit is hyperactive in OCD. It's induced when symptoms go up, and it's changed by treatment. So we have a pretty good reason to focus on that circuit, and I'm going to come back to that later in the talk. But first, I want to move on to what I think is a conceptually useful way to think about these different treatments in OCD and how they um, relate to one another. And these next, this next series of slides I'm going to share with you come from a book chapter that, that I wrote in my 2017 book on OCD um, that tries to take to tackle this question. We have these complex symptoms, to people with different with, um, Two, two people with OCD can have quite different symptoms. How can we think about how they interact? I'm going to go through these a little quickly. For people on the line who aren't familiar with OCD, it, it may be a little too quick, and I apologize for that, but I hope it'll be useful for many of you. So this is a classic way to think about how the different components of OCD go together. Obsessions, the intrusive thoughts that, um, that get stuck in one's mind, lead to anxiety. Anxiety is no fun. So people engage in behaviors to neutralize the anxiety, and those can become compulsions. The compulsions make people feel a little better, at least sometimes, at least partially. That leads to relief. Now, that's all well and good. If you have an unpleasant feeling and you find a behavior that leads to relief, that's a good thing. It's like scratching an itch. The problem is that that relief makes the obsession stronger. Now, this last arrow was always a bit confusing to me. How does relief make the obsession stronger? And it's made a little more clear 
by a slightly modernized and refined view of this cycle. And it is a cycle. If you believe this, if you believe these four arrows, this, this, you can see how these different components feed back on themselves and form a self-reinforcing cycle. Here's, a, here's an updated way to think about that cycle, which I think makes, is a little more accurate, makes a little more sense, and that is this. We start with intrusive cognitions. What do I mean by that? I mean thoughts that come into your mind that seem a little odd and you kind of wish you weren't having. And a dirty little secret is that we all have these. We all have a stream of consciousness that's bubbling along and is not really under our control. It's triggered by things that happen around us as well as thoughts that, that, um, that are entirely within our own minds. And sometimes it comes up with things that seem a little odd, a little inappropriate. Um, that happens all the time. And the fact is, most of us don't notice it most of the time, unless we're explicitly paying attention. Occasionally, something will pop out, like we'll have a, a thought of doing something socially inappropriate um, and say, wow, that was a weird thought. And then many of us will just move on with our lives and say, huh, my, brain's, my brain came up with a weird thought today. So that happens to everyone, these intrusive cognitions. A psychologist have done surveys and come up with 90% of people will admit to having these intrusive thoughts. And in my view, the numbers probably actually should be 100%. It's just it's kind of hard to get people to admit to them, and it's kind of hard to measure them. The problem comes in their interpretation. So if I have a thought that uh, of, of doing something socially inappropriate, saying something rude, or, or I don't know, if I get annoyed with someone you know, kicking their, kicking their shoe or something like that, which I would never actually do in normal company. Um, if I had that thought and I say, wow, I must be a little bit annoyed right now. My brain did a, developed a weird thought and I move on with my day, then nothing happens. But if I have that thought and I say, wow, that was a terrible thought. I must be a terrible person. That's what I call a maladaptive interpretation. That's what the field calls a maladaptive interpretation, meaning that I put an interpretation on that thought that makes it into a bigger deal than it needs to be. That's a maladaptive interpretation. And so the idea is that the maladaptive interpretation is what leads to the anxiety. Having a random intrusive cognition doesn't have to lead to anxiety, but if I interpret it as being meaningful and important, then it can. And then the rest of the cycle follows. I have behaviors which help me get over my anxiety. They lead to relief. And here is where I think that this update of the cycle makes a little more sense. The relief doesn't really do much to the intrusive cognitions. What it does is it reinforces the maladaptive interpretation. Phew, I did that behavior, I, you know, ran away and, and, and well, or maybe I, I guess in the example that I was developing, if I had a, you know, the thought of doing something rude or socially inappropriate, I went and I said uh, a little, a little uh, chastisement to myself in my mind three times, and then I felt that I was corrected, and so I felt a little better. That can make it feel like the, 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 the interpretation of this thought as important and, and, and needful to pay, needful to pay attention to was right, and it's a good thing I took care of it. That's where this last arrow comes from. So this is an update on the OCD cycle. And again, I want to emphasize that this cycle is a feedback. It forms a loop where one step leads to another. And so it's easy to imagine how once you get stuck in this cycle, it could reinforce itself. And we think that's what happens over time in people with OCD. Moving on. We can use this concept of the updated cycle to situate lots of other things that complicate the lives of people with OCD. And each of these next few slides, which introduces another component that can complicate the lives of OCD, could, could be the topic of, of a long discussion. I'm going to go through them pretty quickly, but I hope that, the, that this framework will be useful to think about how all these things fit together. Here's one idea. On this slide, you see attempts at thought control. So if you think that your intrusive thoughts are important, it's the most natural thing in the world to spend an awful lot of energy trying to control them. Unfortunately, humans are really bad at that. In fact, when we try to control our thoughts, it tends to make them stronger. If I try to control an unpleasant or intrusive thought, it's likely to come back, perhaps because in order to control it, I have to notice it, and so I start looking for it. And if I look for it, I'm going to find it. That's a theory. But the fact is that if you try that we're bad at controlling our thoughts, if you try to control your thoughts, they tend to come back. Another thing that's illustrated on this slide is the way that intrusive thoughts can be triggered by things in the world around us. And that certainly happens in OCD, where um, obsessions can be sometimes come out, seem to come out of nowhere, but, but often are triggered by events or things in the environment around us. Something that people with OCD do, do all the time is avoid. So suppose I have obsessions, which cause me uh, a lot of discomfort, about contamination. If I touch anything, then I worry that I'm contaminated and then I want to go wash my hands. Well, what can I do? I can avoid touching anything. 
that may be adaptive. And these days, with all the talk about coronavirus, we're definitely all thinking about these things. So that can be useful in some contexts. But if it comes to the point that you can't open doors, that you can't interact normally with people socially, that you can't leave your home, that avoidance becomes a problem in and of itself. So the avoidance is an attempt to break down the link between stimuli in the environment and unpleasant thoughts. And a little bit of it, avoidance can be okay, but a lot can become a whole new problem. And that's what's illustrated here. All right, what else happens in people with OCD? Well, there are various characterological or psychological predispositions that can lead to a tendency towards maladaptive interpretation. And these have been very carefully um, looked at by um, the Obsessive Compulsive Cognitions Work Group um, back in the 90s and, and the early 2000s. Um, they published a beautiful book that, that, uh, that characterized this. And these are the three dimensions that they found. The over-importance of thought, the idea that if I think something, that is inherently meaningful, that thoughts are just as important as actions. That's one domain. Second domain is the overestimation of threat and a corresponding inflated responsibility. If something bad happens, I should have stopped it. If something bad could happen, I need to do anything possible to avert it, even if the odds are low. So that's a second domain. And a third domain is intolerance of uncertainty, which often goes with perfectionism. If things, if I'm not sure about things, I got to stick with it until I am. And of course, that can be problematic because it's difficult to be sure of anything in the world. We can be pretty sure, we can be sure enough, it's hard to be completely positive much of the time. Now, these three domains are not remotely unique to OCD. These are things that all of us have to some extent or another, and they're often seen in other forms of anxiety. Um, but they, are, they do contribute to maladaptive interpretations and therefore can be a predisposing factor to getting stuck in this OCD cycle. Moving on, I've been talking about anxiety as the thing that drives OCD. It turns out that it doesn't have to be anxiety. About 70% of patients with OCD will describe anxiety as the primary thing that drives them. But some people are driven more by a sense of disgust. Contamination symptoms and cleaning are often driven by disgust. Others are driven by a sort of a harder to describe sense of incompleteness, a sense that things aren't finished or aren't just right. This often drives symptoms associated with symmetry, with a need to order. Not because I'm anxious, but just because it feels wrong and I'm not, I'm not able to move on until I get it right. And that's, so that, that expansion is illustrated here, as is the fact that that anxiety, incompleteness, or disgust, or, or any other negative feeling can feed back to the maladaptive interpretation. We tend to interpret our feelings as a sign that something important is going on. In fact, from an evolutionary point of view, that's a pretty good way to think about emotions. They, they're a signal that something important is going on. So if I'm feeling anxiety, well, then it's perfectly natural to, to, to take that to mean whatever I'm thinking right now is important, and that can feed back on my maladaptive interpretation. A few more complexities in the cycle. Relief can directly derive, drive compulsions. This happens as the cycle goes on, and compulsions can become very automatic. People cannot be having thoughts, or at least not be aware of them, just simply be stuck in a cycle of compulsions. That's illustrated here. And the final thing that's illustrated here is the development of habits. Habits are when a trigger, a sensor, a context, or a sensory stimulus leads directly to a behavior that can become compulsive. And how this feeds into the rest of the cycle, or at least how we've theorized it may feed into the rest of the cycle here, is a little complicated. I'm not going to go into it. But I, I do want to point out that habits are something that's getting more and more research across many um, domains. They're obviously relevant to substance abuse, but they're also relevant to many other neuropsychiatric conditions. And some people have hypothesized that having excessive habits and developing compulsions may actually come first. Maybe the way that you get into this cycle, which raises the idea that I'm not, when I draw this cycle, I'm simply describing what we see in our patients, mostly our adult patients, um, and the way they describe their experience. But you might be able to get into this cycle in different ways. And in fact, when you put all of the different components together in this kind of comically complex figure that I have here, but all, all this is is overlaying all the different components on top of one another. I, I want to make three points here. One is that it's complicated. There's a lot of interacting processes that lead to the experience of people with OCD. The second is this idea of a cycle. With all of this complexity and all of these different arrows sticking out the side, at the core, there's this cycle. Intrusive cognitions, maladaptive interpretations, anxiety, compulsions, relief, feedback cycle. That's at the core of this. And the third thing that this complexity makes clear is that there's probably lots of different ways to get into this cycle. And I think that's probably true. 
Um, I think that probably that if we were able to follow people over decades and catch them before their symptoms develop, I think we'd probably find that there are multiple different ways that one can get stuck in this reinforcing cycle. Once you're in the cycle, that's where OCD comes from. So this is complicated, but I, I hope it's a useful way to conceptualize the way these different components of the illness fit together. I want to move on now uh, to a very brief discussion of our standard treatments. I realize that an interest in treatment is probably what drives uh, many people on the webinar, and so I'm going to hit the important points as clearly as I can, but I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on them because I do want to have a chance to get on at the end to a couple interesting new directions in research. So I've already said that psychotherapy is one of the primary um, uh, treatments for OCD, and in fact, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy with someone who has specific training in OCD should be a first-line treatment and should be considered by everyone um, looking, looking for help with this disorder. It can, when done properly, it can be very effective. And the goal in cognitive behavioral therapy in the terms of this cycle that I've described is simply to interrupt the cycle. So I've suggested that these different components of the cycle reinforce each other and, and get stuck in a feedback loop. The goal of the therapy is to interrupt that loop. And the standard way we do that in a therapeutic strategy known as symptom evocation and response prevention or ritual prevention um, is as follows. We trigger the, the negative thought. So this is easiest to imagine in someone who has negative thoughts about contamination. We trigger the contamination thoughts. They get anxious. What do they want to do? They want to wash their hands. That would be the compulsion. And the core of the therapy is to trigger the thought, trigger the anxiety, and not engage in the compulsion. Now, this is difficult to do um, because the anxiety can become quite acute. And so psychotherapy, is done, if done correctly um, for OCD, is hard work. But if you can do it, if someone can sit there with the anxiety or the other negative feeling, over time, it gets better without any washing at all. It gets better. And as it gets better, that blocks these, uh, this feedback to the maladaptive, maladaptive interpretation. And over time, because you blocked this cycle, that makes the interpretations weaker to begin with. The obsessions begin to get better. So there are a few stages of therapy for most people. The first is simply getting better at tolerating anxiety. That's hard work. It's not fun, but it can work. It can help. As people get better at tolerating anxiety, they also get better at not engaging in their compulsions. And then over time, that can make the entire cycle calm down a little and can make the obsessions uh, get reduced as well. So this can be highly effective. How about medication? The other first-line treatment for obsessive compulsive disorder is a class of antidepressants known as uh, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And these are Prozac or fluoxetine, Luvox or fluvoxamine, Zoloft or sertraline, Paxil or paroxetine, Selexa or citalopram, and Lexapro or escitalopram. I've put a, a seventh drug here, clomipramine or anaphranil. That's an older tricyclic drug, but happens to be a very strong serotonin reuptake blocker and is highly effective for OCD. Now, the first four, Prozac, Luva, I'm sorry, I'll go with the generic names, fluoxetine, fluvoxamine, sertraline, and paroxetine, those have been well studied in multiple studies in OCD, and they've all been approved by the US FDA for its treatment. So those are first-line treatments. Clomipramine or anaphranil at the bottom has also been well studied and is also approved by the FDA. We tend not to use it first line because it has more side effects than the ones at the top, so it tends to be a second line treatment. Citalopram and escitalopram haven't been studied quite as well and they are not approved by the FDA for OCD, but those of us in the field know that they work just as well as the others. We think that all of these drugs are, well, the, the SSRIs, the first six, are pretty much equivalent. Anaphranil, anaphranil, clomipramine, the one on the bottom, seems to be slightly better but as I said, it also, at least for some people, is slightly better. But as I said, it also has more side effects. So we tend to hold that in reserve for a second or third line treatment once we've tried one of the ones at the top. <laughs> this is from a meta-analysis by my colleague Michael Block, um, looking at uh, across all of the studies of SSRIs, all six of the SSRIs in OCD, and looking at symptom change over time. The dotted line shows symptom change over placebo, there is a placebo effect when people come into studies. They tend to get slowly better over time on average. But the people who get uh, the SSRIs, shown in the solid line below, are getting significantly more better 
Um, this is a, the change in that scale I told you, the Y box. So a few points better in the Y box, you get to four or six points better in the Y box, that's starting to be a clinically significant improvement that people are starting, probably starting to notice in their lives. And 10 points better is usually a, a really a pretty substantial improvement. So on average, over 12 weeks, people, uh, people um, get better. Now I say on average, 50% or 60% of people will get significantly better. Unfortunately, not everyone will. And I said that at the beginning, the best treatments we have are useful for some, but not for others. Um, something else you'll see on this, on this uh, graph is that the improvement is, is steady, but quite slow. A typical trial of these medicines in, in OCD is 10 to 12 weeks. That's longer than we usually treat people when we're using the same medicines for anxiety or depression. So, so trials in OCD tend to take a long time. And this is a frustration in the field and a place where more, more research is, is desperately needed. Not everyone's going to respond, and it takes 10 or 12 weeks to learn whether the patient in front of me is going to respond or not. It would be a godsend if we were able to find some test that would, that would tell me at the beginning who's going to respond and who's not. We could save those 10 or 12 weeks for the people who are not going to respond and move on to something else. So that's a desperate need in the field. So people do respond on average. About half of people respond. It takes a long time. And the other thing is higher doses in OCD tend to work better. This is another meta-analysis that I did together with my colleague Michael Block uh, 10 years ago now where we looked at all of the SSRI trials that were available at that time and divided them into low dose, medium dose, and high dose. So for reference, low dose would be 10 or 20 milligrams of Prozac, medium dose would be 30 or 40 milligrams of Prozac, and high dose would be 60 or 80 milligrams of Prozac, which is a higher dose than is typically used in depression. Um, and what you can see is that we get a response at low and medium doses, but we get a higher response at high doses. Uh, so in adults, it's less clear in kids, but in adults, um, high doses are more effective. They also have a slightly higher, um, slightly higher side effect rate as you push the dose up, but on average, there's benefit from pushing the dose up. So those are the key points for the pharmacology and OCD. Is that the SSRIs work about 50% of the time, they're slow, and high doses work better. So now I wanna move on to new directions in pharmacological treatment. What do we do when the SSRIs don't work? Well, one thing is we do psychotherapy, and that should be considered for every patient. A second thing we can do is try a different SSRI, and maybe 10 or 20% of patients who didn't respond to the first will respond to the second. A third thing we can do is um, look at, is, is move to uh, clomipramine, that older drug that I told you seems to work a bit better for some patients, um, but, uh, but, have, but has higher side effects. So we can do that. Um, if those things fail, we have to go on to, to other treatments outside the serotonergic treatment. The best proven of these, which I'm not gonna spend any time on today, but neuroleptic drugs like haloperidol, risperidol, um, aripiprazole or Abilify, these can be helpful not by themselves, but if they're added on top of an SSRI. So that's another strategy. What I wanna move on now is some new research that's going on about different kinds of medicines. And so there's a couple things we and others are looking at. There's been a lot of interest in the field about glutamate modulators. So what is glutamate? Well, if you look at this, this, uh, this diagram of the basal ganglia circuitry that I introduced earlier, if you look carefully, you'll see that the arrows are different colors. And the reason the arrows are different colors is because these are different kinds of neurotransmitter. A neurotransmitter, this red, which corresponds to the neurotransmitter GABA, that is the chemical that's used by neurons in the striatum to communicate with neurons down here in the substantia nigra pars reticulata. So there's a lot of GABA in this circuit. There's also a lot of glutamate, and there's some dopamine. So I told you that we use the neuroleptic drugs, which can affect dopamine. Those can be helpful in some cases. We started asking, geez, almost 20 years ago now, whether... Um, Drugs that affect these projections, the glutamate projections, can also be helpful. And there's a large literature of studies suggesting that glutamate imbalance may contribute to OCD. There were some early neuroimaging studies from David Rosenberg and his colleagues. Um, there were some very interesting studies looking at cerebrospinal fluid and finding elevated glutamate from um, Bhattacharya and colleagues in Germany. So there's a, there's a number of studies that suggest that glutamate might be the place to look. And so we and others have looked at a few different drugs. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about some here. Now, I have to say at the outset here, 
that these medicines that I'm about to tell you about are not nearly as well proven as the serotonergic antidepressants or as the neuroleptics to help with OCD. And everyone should try psychotherapy and everyone should try um, those other better proven drugs before moving on to these less well proven agents. That's an important point for everyone to hear. So I'm gonna be telling you about some things that are less well proven. I don't want anyone to think that they're as well proven or as good as the things, the serotonergic drugs that I've already, that I've already shown you. So one glutamate modulator um, that we and others have looked at is called Riliazole or Riliatec. This is a medicine that was developed by neurologists to treat amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease. Now, Lou Gehrig's disease doesn't really have anything to do with OCD. We, we looked, we couldn't find any affinity in the genetics or anything else. Um, but it did motivate neurologists and, and drug companies to develop this medicine, Riliazole, that is good at tamping down elevated or excessive glutamate. And so we did some studies starting back in 2002 with my original mentor here at Yale, uh, Vlad Chorich, um, looking at glutamate, looking at Riliazole, and, and could we help people if we added Riliazole to their Prozac or to their Luvox or to their, um, to their Lexapro? So we've done a couple of studies in that. I'm showing you the most recent, which is a placebo-controlled study here. Um, and what you can see is that people with placebo over time, over 12 weeks, got slightly better, especially at the end. They were starting to get better on average. People with really, who were treated with really well got a little better, a little faster. It's not that impressive. We think there's a real effect here. This, isn't, this, this trial only had about 38 people in it. We thought we would need a trial with 90 to 100 people to really prove this effect and make it completely convincing. So this should be interpreted as an early study of this drug. But it's, it's suggestive. And... Again, um, not everyone's going to respond the same. So I treated most or all of these patients myself, um, and about half of them um, felt something with the Riliazole, and half felt nothing at all. Some people got quite a bit better. So I think that Riliazole is helpful to some people, but we need larger studies to really prove it. So that's one glutamate modulator we and others have looked at. Another that I'm not showing data from is called Namenda, and there have been a few small studies some of them with placebo control, but if it's suggested that an amenda may be helpful. The one I want to spend two slides on, because um, there's been a lot of talk on it recently in, in the literature and in the popular press, is ketamine. So ketamine is a fascinating drug. It was found here at Yale, by not by me, but by others, um, my colleagues John Crystal, Jerry Santacora, and others. Um, it's been found that a single dose of ketamine can have an antidepressant effect that lasts up to a week or even a few weeks. And this has now been, um, been shown in, in multiple studies using different doses. People have done repeated ketamine. Um, Johnson & Johnson has developed a drug called Spravato, which is now FDA approved. Never, it hasn't been looked at in OCD um, in a, any systematic way. Um, we, a while ago, decided to look at ketamine and OCD. People with OCD often have depression. Uh, and epidemiologically, it's about 40% of people with OCD have depression. In treatment, refractory patients, which I tend to see in my clinic, it's more like 70 or 75 percent. So depression is common in OCD, and we wondered whether this antidepressant would help uh, the OCD. And so we gave ketamine to 10 people with OCD. And what you see on this plot, this is again with my colleague Michael Block, who I've already shown you a couple slides from. Um, what you see in the red, the red dotted line, is their depression. And you can see that after ketamine, their depression got better, and it stayed better for several days. What you see in the blue is what we saw in OCD. And you can see the OCD got better for an hour or two, but it didn't stay very much better. Very small effects out a couple days. So in this first study, with very sick patients, many of whom were depressed, many of whom were on other medications, we didn't see much with ketamine. Now, my colleague at Stanford, Carolyn Rodriguez, who was doing these work, this work at Columbia with Blair Simpson at the time, did another study. Honestly, it's a better study because this one has a placebo control. Um, some people with OCD got ketamine and some people got placebo. And what there's some complexity here in this study because everyone got both ketamine and placebo in one order or the other. I'm not going to go into that complexity. I just want you to note that the dotted line at the top of people who got the, the placebo um, didn't change much in their OCD, whereas people who got ketamine did. Out to a week, so these people did seem to get better. In our first study, it didn't look like they got much better, but in, in Carolyn's um, nicely controlled study, people did. 
And that's kind of where things stand. There hasn't been a lot more work here. So I think the jury's out on whether ketamine is useful for OCD. My interpretation is that uh, the two studies are looking at slightly, at, at slightly different populations. Um, Carolyn's patients were not depressed. They um, were not on other medications. So uh, I, I think that patients like that, there may be patients like that, there may be a, a, some, real, some real benefit for ketamine. The patients in our study were, were depressed, and many were on other medications. They were sicker, um, and so ketamine may not be a magic bullet for that group. More research is needed here. Another direction that people have looked is to develop uh, to look at other medicines that can modulate serotonin. Uh, that's the serotonin molecule on the right. And there are other antidepressants that have been developed, like Remeron and Buspar, or Mutazepine and, and um, Buspiron, that's misspelled, it's Buspiron with a U, um, that are used for depression and anxiety. They've been looked at in OCD with mixed results. Uh, some, some specialists will use these after they've tried everything else, but the data is not particularly strong. It's just a couple studies in each case. There's been a lot of talk recently, um, and, and again, I'm, I'm covering this today because I know that this has been out there in, the, in the, the popular press, and I know that some people on this call have questions about it, about the psychedelic drug psilocybin. Um, psilocybin is found in ma magic mushrooms. Uh, it's a hallucinogenic. It's a Schedule One substance, so it's illegal at the federal level, although there have been some local jurisdictions that have been loosening up uh, restrictions on it. Um, and it is a serotonin agent. It binds at the serotonin 2A and 2C receptors as well as the serotonin 1A receptor. The binding at the serotonin 2A receptor is what makes, it, makes people hallucinate. Um, there's a very little bit of evidence that OCD can help. I'm sorry, that psilocybin can help with OCD. There's better evidence, still far from sufficient, but better evidence that it might be able to help with depression. And so we here at Yale as well as others at NYU Hopkins and other places are, are looking uh, very excitedly about whether we can we can you know, delineate a benefit in depression. Um, but there is this little bit of evidence that it might help in OCD. This is the only uh, study, there have been some case reports looking at one or two people. Um, this here is the only study in the literature that's looked at a bunch of people. This was nine people, no placebo control, done by Moreno and colleagues at the University of Arizona quite a few years ago now. And they gave several doses of psilocybin to these nine people with depression and found benefit lasting out to 24 hours. They didn't follow longer than that. So that's exciting. Now, this is not, I am not advocating that people with OCD go and try psilocybin. I think that would be extremely premature. More research here is needed. Um, and we at Yale have just started the first placebo controlled study of um, psilocybin in OCD. We're not using the mushrooms like those shown on the left. We're using pharmacological grade psilocybin um, and we're, we're trying to you know, get, get some better data in a placebo-controlled study of whether there really is something here that we can pursue. Um, psilocybin is a scheduled drug. It's not, um, it's not legally available for treatment, and so this is not something I advocate, but it is an exciting direction of current research that I wanted to share with you. <coughs> Finally, the last piece of research that we're doing here at Yale that I want to share with you um, is, it, is an approach called neurofeedback. And this is a non-pharmacological approach, but one that's informed by the brain biology, including some of what I showed you earlier in this talk. Um, so we know, as I showed you, go all the way going back to this 1987 PET study by Lou Baxter, we know that the orbitofrontal cortex is uh, hyperactive in people with OCD. Um, we know, and this is the review that's noted there, the van der Straaten review, we know that the OFC is um, responds with treatment. We know that when people's symptoms get better, their OFC calms down, ceases to be so hyperactive. And in, in studies across the last 30 years, the OFC keeps coming up again and again. These are some studies from, from me and my collaborators over the years. One on the left shows activation of the OCD when people are with OCD, um, subclinical OCD in this case, are shown uh, pictures that trigger their symptoms. The one on the right is an fMRI connectivity study I did with my colleague Alan Mantisevich a few years back. Um, shows that connectivity, how different parts of the brain talk to one another, is disrupted in the OFC in people with OCD. If you look to the literature, this is the most consistent finding um, in my read of the literature that there is, that OFC hyperactivity and abnormalities are seen in many patients. So we asked ourselves the question some years ago, uh, and we here uh, with my colleague Michelle Hampson, very talented neuroimager here at Yellow, I have a long-running collaboration with. We said, all right, the OFC calms down when people get better. If we could find a different way 
to calm the OFC down, well, maybe that would be a treatment. And the treatment that Michelle developed to do this, I'm sorry, I shouldn't call it a treatment yet, but the, the strategy that Michelle developed to do this is one called neurofeedback. And here's how neurofeedback works. So, so neurofeedback is a form of biofeedback. And biofeedback it simply means learning how to control something about your body by being shown it on a, on a monitor. I show you your heart rate on a monitor, and over time, through trial and error, you can control your heart rate. At least many people can control their heart rate a little better. I show you how much you're sweating. You're what's called the galvanic skin response on a monitor. That's not normally something you can control, but over time, um, with the feedback, you can learn to control it. Neurofeedback is the same thing, except what we're showing people is the activity of their brain. So what we did is we put people in the brain scanner, and we showed, if you look on the right, we showed them pictures, we showed them an instruction, this white arrow means relax, don't do anything, and we showed them the activity of their orbitofrontal cortex in real time. This happens a second, in a second and a half. You get, you get feedback on, how, on the activity of your orbitofrontal cortex. Sometimes this arrow turns red and points up, and at those times, people are told to take this line and push it up. And at first, they have no idea how to do that. But over time, with trial and error learning, people can begin to get the hang of it. And you can see that this person was able to push it up when the arrow was red and up, and was able to push it back down when the arrow was blue and down, following the instructions. So this, people learned to, this person this, in, in this image learned to control their orbitofrontal cortex. Well, can that help with anxiety? That's, that's the real question. Can learning to control the orbitofrontal cortex help with anxiety? Well, our data suggests in a small pilot study published a few years ago, suggests that they can. This is in subclinical OCD. We're doing it in clinical OCD now. Those data aren't ready yet. Um, but in people who got biofeedback, they got better. The anxiety was reduced at, out to at least a few days after the biofeedback. That's what's shown here. In people who got a sham feedback, they were still in the magnet. They still saw the images, but they didn't get biofeedback. They did not have that change. So it appears to change anxiety, and it also appears to change the connectivity of the brain. <coughs> this is work that is published. Uh, we are now doing a study of doing this in people with a treatment study in people with OCD, and I hope to have data to show on the outcomes of that study soon. Um, this is not ready for a treatment yet. This is not a generally available thing that I advise people to get. I think that people should stick with the proven treatments of psychotherapy and the SSRI antidepressants. Um, but it is an exciting new frontier in research that I wanted to share with you today. So that brings us to the end of today's talk, uh, just a review of, of what I've talked to with you. I gave you an overview of OCD, talked a little bit about what's going on in the brain according to brain imaging studies. I spent a little time on this framework of how we think about how the different components or cognitive processes that are going on in OCD connect with one another. And that becomes complicated when you put them all together, but I think it's, it's a useful framework to, to think about these matters. I talked a little bit about standard treatments, both psychotherapy and pharmacological therapy, and then I shared with you two new directions, which are not alternative treatments at this time, but are exciting new directions that hope will lead to new strategies that when they're adequately proven can bring new relief to that 25% of people who do not respond to what we have to offer today. These new pharmacology, pharmacological tools and this new strategy of biofeedback. So those aren't treatments yet, but I hope that someday they or other strategies that we and others are, are developing uh, will get there. I want to acknowledge our patients and our families, without whom none of this research um, can happen. Um, I've noted a bunch of my colleagues who I've worked with on, on various studies, and, and they are listed here. I want to thank all of my staff here at Yale um, who put up with me and support me and make this work possible. And I want to thank our funders. They were listed more comprehensively on the acknowledgement, on the, the, the conflict slide at the beginning. Um, but I, I particularly want to give a shout out to the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation, from whom I've gotten a couple grants over the years. They're really a remarkable organization in the way that they identify especially young people and give them a boost, as they did me. Uh, and, and I and I know others in this field are, are grateful for that support. I thank you for all your attention. I've used most of the time with these slides, but in the time that remains, I'm happy to take questions. Great. Chris, thank you for a really an outstanding presentation covering a lot of information. And, uh, and just as importantly, thank you, more importantly, thank you for all the work that you've done in this area. Uh, one question that, that a few people asked was about uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation, TMS. Is, is there any evidence about whether or not that can be helpful either as an adjunct or as a direct treatment uh, for yeah. OCD? Um, there is. 
Um, so TMS is approved by the FDA as well as in other countries for depression targeting um, a particular target on the side of the front of the brain, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, especially on the left side. Um, that particular target doesn't appear to work very well in OCD. But if you look more medially towards the middle of the head at a, a target called the supplementary motor area or SMA or just in front of that, the pre-SMA, in a series of studies um, originally by Montavani um, in Italy and then working with Blair Simpson at Columbia and then in a few follow-up studies, it looks like there is some benefit from that target. So it's not, the thing about TMS is you have to decide how to stimulate, you also have to decide where to stimulate. So unlike with a medication where the only variable really is the dose, with TMS there are more variables. Um, and the target that's used for depression doesn't appear to help um, according to the most recent meta-analyses that I've seen, but the, the more medial target, the SMA does. Now I have to say, the effects aren't very big, and I don't tend to use that as a clinical treatment. Very recently, there's been a new strategy, um, it's called deep TMS, and it's using a, a large coil um, that stimulates the brain kind of all over with the goal of getting the TMS stimulation down to deeper structures. Remember in that neuroimaging, the structures that were hyperactive weren't on the dorsal surface of the brain. They were deep down inside. So deep TMS um, has been developed, and uh, for OCD, it's been developed by a company called Brainsway. I just want to acknowledge that I have received consulting income from Brainsway, and I've given them some advice on the development of this, although I don't own stock or anything like that. Um, they did what I thought was a very nice study um, with, that suggested that the deep TMS can be helpful for OCD, and on the basis of that study, they got FDA approval. Not as many centers are doing the deep TMS yet, because it requires a different machine than the older depression TMS, but I do think that there's some, some potential there. Um, although exactly where it falls in a treatment algorithm, when it should be done relative to SSRIs or to psychotherapy, I don't yet have a clear sense. Uh, thank you. Uh, once again, an excellent full response with a lot of information. We have time for one more question. I want to ask a little bit about uh, the age of onset and in particular when the issue of children, adolescents, and OCD. Sure, yeah, that's, that's an important question. Um, we think that there are two peaks in onset in OCD. Um, early onset, which can be anywhere from about, say, age 7 to age 15, al although these peaks sort of blur together, so it's not, it's not perfectly well defined. But early onset OCD appears to have a higher genetic component. It appears to happen more in boys than in girls, and it's often associated with ticks with tick Tourette syndrome and other tick disorders. It'll often happen that someone with a tick, a kid with a tick disorder, um, as they age, their ticks will get better, but then OCD symptoms will appear. Um, later onset can happen anywhere between late adolescence, mid to late adolescence, and say the mid 30s to 40s. So a very broad peak. Um, and that appears to have a, a basically a one-to-one uh, gender balance, some studies suggest a female preponderance in the, in the later onset and is not associated with ticks. It's less genetic. It's likely that these are two somewhat different um, entities. And you remember I said in that very complicated slide trying to put together all the components of OCD, it may be that these are two different ways to get into that cycle. But we don't know enough yet to be able to, to tease apart the ways in which they differ. So, so the onset is very broad. It can be from you know young childhood um, all the way to mid adulthood. Um, it does look like there are these two different groups. If onset is very late after 40, I start to wonder about neurological um, problems, or or maybe just that symptoms were there but they weren't diagnosed. Um, so late onset is uncommon. Once again, Chris, thank you for all that you're doing for joining us today. I very much appreciate it. I also want to thank everybody who uh, joined us uh, in the audience um, and uh, remind people that 100% of all donor contributions for research are invested in our grants to scientists. All the research we fund is made possible through supporters like you. So please consider making a gift by visiting bbrfoundation.org or call 1-800 829-8289. This webinar has been recorded. If you've missed any portion or would like to share it with family and friends, 
please visit the events and webinars page on our website. I hope you'll join us again in April when Dr. Stephen Marin, Distinguished Professor in the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences at Texas A&M University will present, Can Traumatic Memories Be Erased? This webinar will take place on Tuesday, April 14th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Once again, thank you for joining us. Take care.